I shudder to think that uh, I might be one of the interesting ones, because I'm sure that's... Uh, I'm basically going to try and bore you uh, as much as I can. Um, uh, or or melt the brain, something like that. Anyway, I'll get started, because it's a, it's a short uh, topic, and we've been here for a while. Um, so I'm here to talk about uh, Triple O, which is the second open stack. We'll get to what that means in a second. Uh, first of all, I thought I'd take a brief second uh, on the off chance that you all aren't aware of my mega superstardom internationally. Uh, to talk about uh, who I am, uh, why I might be talking to you. Uh, I work for HP in the Cloud Services Division, um, or business unit, I think it's a business unit. Uh, I you happen to learn the fourth to speak. Um, uh, I started the, the OpenStack infrastructure uh, project inside of OpenStack, so we run all the continuous integration uh, and developer tooling uh, for the project for the reason that uh, we can run 800 uh, active developers, uh, which is kind of a lot of people. Um, so we, we do all of those sorts of things. Uh, I've also run a triple O group, um, and uh, amongst, it, it, amazingly, and after all of that, I have some amount of time to set up the OpenStack Foundations Board um, and on the technical committee, which is the geek version of the foundation board. So one of them talks about the business things, the other the tech things, and I get to be in all of their meetings. It's really fun when we have joint sessions, because I get to meet two people at once. Um, also, if you want to find me online, uh, Imanti on Twitter, it's entirely possible that, that that isn't supposed to have an underscore in it. I don't really know, because I can't remember where I'm to have an underscore and where I don't. Uh, or also, always on Freenode, uh, IRC, uh, and I'm Mordred there, except on casual Nick Fridays, uh, in which case I'm the Ronin. Um, I wasn't my choice. Uh, so anyway, so I think we've seen this picture right here. Um, probably in, uh, in, in more than one slide, I'm sure, and there's also a nice poster of it outside. Um, this is, this is OpenStack. OpenStack is a cloud, right? So what, is, what does that mean? At this point, I'm sure we all know um, that it allows you to get at uh, compute and networking and storage resources via an API. Um, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, it's, it's a really good thing. Um, uh, and we've had a lot of discussion actually today on, on why we might want to do that, why we might want to abstract away these sorts of things um, and, and get to them. Um, and it comes down to, uh, I, I think I've heard this from everybody's, in, in most of the talks I've heard this morning, uh, it comes down to, to, to velocity from a, from a technical or from a business perspective. Um, using, using the cloud, Right, uh, enables you to deliver your applications uh, more quickly. Right, um, it allows you to, uh, to 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 work in agile manner, and allows you to develop and test uh, to enable your developers to develop and test uh, in in an environment where they can actually access this stuff. They want to do something; they don't have to ask IT for something. They just do an API call and they spin up a thing and it's great. Right, so that they can test that and then they can uh, deploy it into their cloud uh, in using the same mechanisms. This is fantastic for everybody. Um, and the more complicated your application is, the more this is important, right? Because the more you need to be able to verify that things work. Uh, so you're going you're to do that. Um, so if we're going to talk about complicated applications that you're going to deploy. Um, this is a picture of what OpenStack actually looks like. Um, it's not the nice clean picture from before, uh, but it turns out it's got a lot of moving parts, and they have a lot of dependencies on each other. Uh, and it's it's kind of really different. We've heard that actually a lot uh, today too. Uh, that it's it's, it's a neat thing, but man, is it hard to deploy, right? It's, it's hard to update, it's hard to, to deal with, it takes smart ops guys, and then once they've done their job, then you know, the, the developers get a cool cloud to, to build their apps on. Um, uh, so this is where we figured um, if we've got a cloud that allows us to uh, have a more agile way uh, for our developers to work on complicated applications and deploy them and test them in a consistent manner, um, we might as well use that to deploy the complicated application that is OpenStack um, because we've already got all the tools in the cloud to be able to deploy a massive multi-node application in a manner that makes sense. So, um, so by doing this, uh, this allows us to, um, to have a true continuous integration and delivery store, right? Because you can test all of the things that you're doing uh, for OpenStack uh, in an OpenStack. Um, uh, which is really sort of neat. So that allows you, with all of the other velocity things, uh, it allows you to, to, to run a cloud at a, at a uh, greatly uh, decreased uh, cost of, of maintenance um, and uh, 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 the engineering. Um, it, it allows you also to encapsulate what you're doing, right? Because now we can, we can express this in cloud terminology, right? We, we, can, we can 
rather than having it be like some guys with beards in a data center running around being heroes and writing a bunch of Ruby scripts. Um, it, it, it allows you to actually describe this stuff sensibly in a, in a, in a you know, repository somewhere and then test that and then move. Um, and, and then what's even better is that you've actually now got a common API for your infrastructure level uh, that you do for uh, your, your actual cloud. So for everything from your, from your data center level all the way up to your, to your customer facing applications, you're using the same tools and you're using the same APIs to, to manipulate all of those things. Um, so when you're running a thing like this, there's, uh, there's some problems that you're going to run into. Um, your, your software that you're trying to install or upgrade, um, it's going to have bugs. Uh, we, we all like to think that we write bug-free code, but it turns out that, that we don't. Um, you're going to, over, over several thousand machines in a data center, uh, at least as it's running so far, you're probably going to develop some entropy and some crop in those machines. Your, your chef recipes are going to install some new packages and you're going to have forgotten to uninstall the old package that were there you don't use anymore. Um, and you don't really want to put those into your chef recipes because now, now your current chef recipes are, are listing all of the states that your, that your server might have been in in the past so that it might be able to clean them up uh, and move forward. And so even your clean uh, you know, puppet stuff that's in the corner that's describing what your application is also is having to describe where your application might have been. Um, and, and so you, you sort of develop either Croft on the machines or you develop Croft in your description of what the machines should be doing. Uh, and this is, this is unfortunate uh, over time. Uh, and then additionally, uh, other things that can fail are hardware failure. Right. Oh, so I'm sorry, that's just entropy and that might seem like bad, but once you've got all this type stuff, it makes it harder for you to figure out what went wrong when something went wrong. This is the reason that's a bad thing. Um, in case you just thought that maybe having Croft and added entropy was a good thing. Um, uh, I figure I should just tell you why it's, it's a bad thing. Um, and then hardware failed, it turns out. Um, I don't know if you've ever experienced a server crashing uh, before or power failure, but it turns out things break, um, and so you've got to deal with that. So the way we deal with all these things, um, is uh, for, for dealing with bugs, then one of the best ways that we can do it is uh, by a, a CI CD process. Right? So we, we test the code before we deploy it. It might sound a little bit uh, silly to point that out, but it turns out a lot of people don't do that. They just deploy the code and then see whether it breaks or not. Um, or they just deploy the code and then go on vacation. Um, for the crop entropy thing, if we, if we, if we go to a, an image based approach um, and not to say the name of the big elephant in the room because apparently we're not supposed to be talking about Amazon um, from earlier. Uh, but, uh, but most of us know that you can get an AM, like a, a person's going to hand you some software in the form of an AMI, right? And, and you can then deploy that onto the cloud. And so images have actually become a, a pretty standard way to, to ship software to other people. In fact, you can also get a private GitHub if you want to deploy that locally. Uh, they're going to ship you actually a VM image um, that's self-contained and you're going to install it in your VMware ESX cluster. Uh, and that's that's actually they don't give you an installer. They give you a they give you something. So this is a this is a unit of software that we've actually gotten pretty good at dealing with in the cloud and virtualization space. Um, in, in, if we make those images, that they actually don't change very much because it's it's just the image. So um, if we can deploy based on those, then we're not developing profit and entropy over time. We're, we're we're going from a known good pristine state, which is the state that we tested. Um, and then additionally. Uh, and it, it ties into how, how well this works. Um, you've got to have a high availability story for, for, all of your, for all of your machines. If you don't have a high availability story, you can't be running a resilient service. It's just not going to work. If you do have an HA setup, it allows you to do some pretty interesting things in terms of scaling and software rollout. Because um, if you have the capability to have a server fail and replace it with another server, which you sort of need to have a resilient ser service, then you can make use of that capability in terms of rolling out uh, new updates to your service. You're like, oh, hey, I already know how it works. I'll just uh, kill this one and bring up a new one that's the new version. That's the costly way. There's ways to optimize that. But anyway, um, it turns out that I battle sometimes, so I might have to talk a little bit faster. So here's, um, here's the workflow. Um, uh, here's, here's the workflow of, of how, uh, how this looks. And I'm sure that you can all read all the small text and all the small boxes there. Um, but, uh, but it starts with a developer, right? A developer on their laptop, and that's a, I think that's an HP laptop. Um, a developer on their HP laptop writes a, writes a change, right? This is how we deploy things. Somebody at some point in time had to write a change. Uh, they upload that uh, into, a, uh, into, a, into a code review system. I can say it, I don't think it's listed on the slide. But they clearly upload it into a code review system that looks exactly like OpenStax. Um, and, uh, and people code review it and, and decide that it's good. And then at this point, what we do is we, we, we have some, uh, we have a friend, Jenkins over here, uh, build us an image. 
Uh, and we upload that into uh, into a Glamp server, right? Because we've got Glamp that stores images for OpenStack. Um, at this point, this isn't a published Glamp server. This is just a, a Glamp server, and we have. Um, We've got some some bare metal machines over in the cloud, right? So we deploy it. We deploy the image, the actual thing that we want to deploy, um, and we test that, right? And either that succeeds, in which case we save the, the result of the image into a, into a happy place, or it fails, and we tell the developer to go back and learn how to write code. Um, but at that point, this is this is just the the, the sort of uh, first testing that the image itself is an image that works, right? Like this is does this image boot? Like not does it do anything? Does it boot? Um, we save the result there, uh, and then and then we come over here and we start we start spinning up an actual file using that image and the combination of the other images you might have, uh, and we sort of we sort of go through the same cycle again. This is all sort of based off of a single chain to develop the first step, right? This is all automatic. We don't have people having to do any of this. Uh, so we spin up a cloud, right? Because now we've got we've got the, the ability to spin up a cloud using the cloud. Um, so we can we can take this image and the other images that we need and spin up a full I don't know say 20 node cloud um, and, uh, and 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 check that the that the image works in concert with the other images that are in our, our set of images and then if that works we upload it into our production uh, Glamp server at which point if you're if you're really ballsy um, you can just uh, deploy it straight to production because you actually know that it worked because you just tested it so you should have no fear of rolling it out. Uh, you should not be worried that, oh, rolling out 150 updates to my production cloud a day is scary, um, because you just tested the work, so you know. Um, and it's not about fear, it's about uncertainty. Um, so anyway, this breaks down into a few different concerns um, uh, in able to do this. Uh, you've, you've, got, uh, you've got provisioning of software, uh, you've got provisioning of, of servers, you've got software that needs to go on the servers. You've got the configuration of the software that needs to go on the servers. You've got some state management tasks that need to happen around the configuration of software that goes on the servers. And, uh, and finally, um, most of these things don't run on one server. Most of these things run on multiple servers, and you've got cross-server dependencies, which I gotta tell you the package graphs in our in app and RPM, uh, or dpackage and RPM don't really handle at all, actually, because they're they're only single machine aware. Um, uh, so you need you need some sort of larger view of hey I need a MySQL server and now I need a WordPress server and now I need a load balancer in, on top of the, the two uh, uh, two WordPress servers that are just signed uh, spun up. There's dependencies between these and so that's the orchestration layer. So in our world we like to we like to um, make things into self-contained units uh, that you can reason about uh, reasonably easily. Um, we're going to use Nova for provisioning because it turns out that Nova is the way that OpenStack provisions machine resources. Uh, we wrote a piece of software called Disk Image Builder that we use to uh, go figure write disk images. Um, it's an amazing ability we have to make uh, great names for software. Um, we have a couple small tools, uh, one called Oscom Big Applier and one called Oscom Big Refresh that I'll go to in more detail up in the back of the I think we're running out of time already. Um, that do uh, the simple tasks of, of applying configuration and also managing the state transitions around that. And then Heat, uh, which is the, the, the newest member, one of the newest members of the OpenStack family, um, is is what we use to actually drive the the uh, both the deployment of and the ongoing lifecycle maintenance of the of the images that are that are in our system right here. So just because we like to be snarky, um, there's there's other people that are playing in this space in some places, and some of the reasons that we think that maybe they've uh, they've stated the problem domain of their particular pieces of software incorrectly. Um, however, it's worth noting that none of ours, none of the pieces of our puzzle depend on the other pieces of the puzzle. There, there's clear separations, so there's absolutely nothing to prevent you from using Nova, the Disk Image Builder, and Heat, and uh, tossing Chef or Puppet in there to do the config management of the of the on, on machine systems. Um, if that's a thing that you that you find is interesting in your world. Um, so these are the components. Uh, it was already a part of this done there. Uh, no rubber metal is, is sort of the thing that makes this work. I'll talk about it in a second. Uh, for those of you who don't keep up with every single message on the OpenStack mailing lists, um, we have split the no rubber metal drivers out into the room project uh, for the Havana cycle. Uh, and that project is uh, now called Ironic. Um, there's at least three jokes in that. Um, Heat uh, is the is orchestration thing, like I mentioned. Disk Image Builder, Oscom Figure Flyer, and Oscom Figure Refresh are all projects that are on Stack Forge. There's currently uh, discussions around Disk Image Builder in terms of where in the OpenStack project that wants to live, whether it needs to be a, an ancillary project of, of Glance, or whether it needs to be its own top level thing. Uh, we're starting to use it uh, in, in several of the OpenStack projects. Um, so Nova Bare Metal is a thing that might take a, a, a brief second to, to wrap your head around, but it's actually not that bad. If you stop thinking of clouds as things that give you VMs, right? If you stop thinking of Nova as a thing that gives you VMs, 
uh, and, and, and don't fix it on the, on the virtual word there, um, but just think of it as, as a way to get an abstract machine or service. I want to, via an API called get a machine, um, then the Nova bare metal makes absolute sense. So what it is is it slots into Nova, it's a driver that slots into the virtualization driver level, which should probably be a name. But um, it slots in there and, and it, it provides uh, instead of making local KVM calls or local, you know, Zen calls or whatever, it actually makes Pixie and IPMI calls uh, to, to bare metal hardware that has been listed with the with Nova bare metal service. So it allows you to treat the uh, the bare metal machines you have in your data center as if they were uh, a, a cloud of, of virtual machines. Um, and then um, in, a, in a bit of, of madness, um, because it's hard to test uh, running a fleet of bare metal machines on your laptop, uh, we do have a, a virtualized bare metal driver um, <laughs> that works quite nicely. Uh, you can you can spin up some KVM hosts on your own uh, or some virtual box hosts so actually if you want to, uh, and you can register them uh, and have Nova Pixie boot them uh, on your on your on your local machine. Uh, I promise it's fun. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> uh, you got to go and test this stuff because it all comes back to testing. Um, he, the next piece in, in the puzzle here, uh, he focuses on orchestration. He, he is, the, is the person who is pulling all the strings and saying, hey, you spin up this. I need, I need four Nova compute nodes and we need a load balancer. It knows how to do all those types of things. Um, it's worth an integration management system. He does not care about what software you're installing in your system. It's just spinning up the resources that you tell it to spin up. And, and one of the really interesting things, and we've been talking with the, the Crowbar and, uh, and, and Chef guys, and we've been talking with the guys at Puppet Labs, about this is, uh, and actually also the guys from ThoughtStack. Um, so, you've got better running, uh, except for the CF Engine guys. I, don't, I didn't know there was CF Engine guys still around. Um, but, uh, anyway, uh, so I guess we should have a conversation with them. Um, what happens is that he knows the, the machine-specific config things, right? Because it's, it's got the big picture. So it knows, I'm spinning you up and this is your host name, or I'm spinning you up Nova Compute Node, and here's the Keystone API endpoint that you need to know about was from, from over here, like here, because that's, that's what you know at that level of the, of the picture. Um, and it delivers those configuration-specific pieces of information into a JSON file uh, on, the, on the machine. Um, at that point, a tool, in our case, OS can pick a flyer, but in, in, in other cases, it could be Chef, or it could be Puppet, can read the JSON, like, oh, hi, from, from Chef, read the JSON file right now, and you can use those as, as uh, fact information about your, about your machine and write your, uh, write your config management templates in terms of those as input parameters, right? So you've actually got now, now nicely parameterized single machine templates that don't depend on any sort of understanding of what your larger orchestration uh, framework is. Uh, it's almost like it's an interface. Um, uh, anyway, so, and then, and then your server can kick it back up to the heat server when it's done. Uh, we have a set of templates uh, at uh, openstacks.ops flash templates that describe an OpenStack installation in terms of, of heat templates, right? So you can grab those heat templates and use them to find them. Man, I got it. Uh, so anyway, so they're up there. You can grab those uh, and start working with this on them. Uh, we, we are using these to run uh, run at least a rack a year at the moment. It's, it's working nicely. So uh, they're not as broken down as they could be for a data center, but you know you can come up and sort of that. Um, so what happens when he's when he's doing things is there's a uh, there's a new metadata event. You say, hey, I've added a new uh, you know an additional uh, service in the thing. I need to let everybody in the, in the rest of the file know about it. Um, so you, you you change the metadata. You upload that to heat, and heat starts pinging people. And it does it in in a, in a decent order. It says, oh hey, I'm going to do a rolling update of this information. Server number one, I've got some new metadata for you. And so it sends the trigger. Um, a thing on the machine at that point. Uh, and our, our tools also can refresh config and also configure flyer. No, to do this, you need to quiesce any fragile services. There are services that freak out if you change their configuration out from underneath them. So you might need to, 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 to quiesce those. Uh, you might need to upgrade uh, software from events uh, if, if there's an image update you need to do. You might need to reboot if the, if the kernel got updated, right? Sometimes that's just, uh, uh, it's just necessary. Um, or you might not to. You might not need to do that. Uh, and then you need to uh, to make sure that your your required services are running, and then you might need to, to perform post uh, uh, post update um, uh, migrations, right? So these are all standard things. These are like Chef and Puppet do this. That's fine. But just sort of breaking them out as these are the actual things that need to happen on a per machine basis. And then the neat thing is, is that when that's done, um, the, the the system uh, sends a ping back to Heat saying, "Yep, done." Got all that for you. So that as he's doing a rolling deploy, he can then move on to the next the next server in the graph, right? And he, he keeps a dependency graph, so it can do this 
in parallel in terms of the servers that are uh, that are dependent on each other. So it, it can do a rolling upgrade of the particular service that's in that's in question uh, without having to, to, to ping everything on a, on a single threaded uh, fly there. But this is a, this is also a, 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 a nice thing over the general sort of uh, Chef Republic polling model where it's going to grab the things and run them locally, but you actually have absolutely no idea when it's going to um, It may or may not have been successful. Uh, and you're going to keep going on with your other ones. So anyway, so that's a nice thing. Um, but like I said, anyway, so uh, images, because I am going to time to talk faster. Um, with the disk image builder, we, we, make a, we make an image that's got the set of software that you need. Um, and this excludes configuration and excludes persistent state. So if your image is of a MySQL server, you probably don't want to configure it to stick the MySQL databases in the, in the image namespace, right? Like if you want that to be the, the, the version of MySQL you've installed, the database is probably going to go in slash bar somewhere, right? Um, Splat these down, uh, Nova Bernal uh, kicks up, splats them down, and then we use heat, via, via heat we use Chef and Hubbard or Oscar Pickle Flyers and like that to get config files in and to get everything in, uh, up there. And then if we want to uh, do an update, um, then we can we can do something actually as simple as an rsync of the of the of the new image contents over the top of the of the read-only root file system that we deployed with the original image. Uh, and your image updates, your your upgrades now take like I don't know, like a minute, um, uh, which is which is nice when you're considering upgrading a thousand things that you might have to have individual machine downtime while you're doing the upgrade because you've got to put the things on there. So anyway, that's the cool thing. We've got um, we've got a tool just <coughs> developer, like I said. We've also got a set of image elements that, that we use to create those, and it's it's combined. Um, I'm going to keep moving on. Uh, so like the heat defines a cluster. Heat tells the Nova API to deliver the images to the machines. Um, and so you can do this with virtual machines in your dev test environment, right? Because these are just cloud images that we've created. Disk image builder creates an image that can upload the lands. So you can boot a VM with it. And then, if that works, you can use the exact same unmodified image to boot your bare metal machines. Because um, it's not running in the solid, it's not doing a thing. It's actually just DDing bytes down on the disk. Uh, it's pretty, it's, it's, it's pretty stinking awesome. Um, so you, you actually can test your production and deployment in, in your environment in the exact way it's going to get installed. Um, performance of this actually works out really nice. Um, uh, because you're doing all of the hard stuff at image build time, uh, this is a lesson we learned from C and C plus plus, right? In Java, like do all of your do all of your your hard work in pile time, so that at runtime you're not having to do all of that all of that work every single time. Um, so that's essentially what we're doing. We're compiling the images. We've got them. All of that stuff's done. So all I'm doing is splatting bytes across network when I'm when I'm deploying it to go from a completely unconfigured, un anything, un OS machine. I do my pixie boot it, install the image. Uh, currently takes about six minutes. Um, and that's because it's got to do two power one self tests cycles uh, in, in that process. So most of that time is spent rebooting. Um, so it's extremely efficient when compared with something like running a, 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 an OS uh, yeah. a, a installer and a pre seed file, um, it, which usually takes you about 45 minutes to an hour. Um, so that may or, not, may or may not be the most important thing. So anyway, so you get your, your bare metal cloud, right? You've done that, that's cool, you've deployed some things. Um, the, the way that we're arranging this right now is we, we, we refer to it as an under cloud and the open cloud, right? Because you've got, you've got your bare metal cloud, it's got your bare metal uh, uh, hosts in it. Um, and then on that, what you want to do is you want to run clouds. But you don't have to just run one cloud on it, you can run more than one. Um, because each of the clouds, the, each of the over clouds is actually, is actually a tenant in the, in the under cloud, right? So if you want to have a data center worth of machines that's, that's managed by, um, by OpenStack and the bare metal side of things, there's your under cloud. Now you want to spin up a production tenant, and there's your production thing. We just put spin up a dev test tenant. And so it's actually the exact same gear, it's the exact same setup, it's just different tenant separation. Um, and and you, again, you can manage all of this with the, with the appropriate APIs. Um, uh, so the under cloud itself, and this is where, where it gets really fun, the under cloud itself is a fully HA bare metal open stack. Um, right? It's, it's self-hosted because it knows how to spin up bare metal nodes, right? So it can actually, from a bootstrap node, once you get yourself up and going, and this is the part where it's better to just sit and drink a beer with me and I can walk through that, you get that up, the bare metal cloud can actually install itself onto more bare metal nodes as needed. And if it needs to, to upgrade itself, it can just <coughs> pop down one of its sides, redeploy re onto that piece of bare metal, and then do the failover and redeploy itself onto itself onto the, onto the thing. And so you have basically created Skynet, and, um, and the next thing that comes in is, uh, you know, I get a really cool um, machine gun and a better haircut. Um, because I think that's what happened. Anyway, um, so, so, you get the, so we can basically run the undercloud with as little as two machines, right? It doesn't take that many machines to run the bare metal cloud. 
um, uh, and we can basically do a you know a data center for that. Or we can also, but we can actually scale those two nodes out into forty if you want to. It's open stack; you can do whatever you want to. Um, Open Cloud is a fully HA uh, KVM based open stack that's hosted as a in the under in the under cloud. We've done that. It's all orchestrated by Heat, so we use Heat in the under cloud to deploy the open stack in the, in the open cloud. Um, uh, and I'll also, like I said, you pretty much with a couple of minor exceptions, use the exact same disk images to deploy your open cloud as you use to deploy your under cloud. Um, I, I moved through that uh, just a second ago, so I'm not going to uh, because I'm, I believe I'm way out of time actually. So um, are there, uh, right at it, are there, are there any questions? <laughs> Only one question. Yes. Alexi. What about Alexi? You mentioned that if you can use your mm -hmm. they use VMs, you know, like regular VMs. Yeah. Right? And you can use Alexi. Totally. Yeah, you can do, you can do anything you like. It's, so so the, this is sort of the, the, the setup that we've got right now is using the bare metal and then using the, the um, uh, the, the KVM host on that. You can also totally splat out nodes that have LXC containers in them. In fact, uh, the, um, uh, some, I don't know what I was going to say, 